I want to welcome everyone to our online service. It's great that uh, you're with us, and we just hope and pray that this is a meaningful time for you. A few announcements just about the life of our church before we carry on. Number one, I want you to know ministry carries on at IPC. Uh, the elders have met uh, weekly and will continue to, it seems. There's lots to be considered and to be uh, thought through, and the leadership is great. It's, it's there and it's in place. Staff are working mostly online and impacting lives. So please pray for us as we redesign ministry, as we think differently, obviously, about how the church will function, but still want to see God impact lives in really significant ways. Secondly, I want to let you know that daily we are communicating, seeking to communicate with you and others on social media, on Facebook and on Instagram. If you're not aware of that, uh, please uh, connect in those ways so that you get the messages that we're sending out, and hopefully that will be of real help to you. If you know someone who's not uh, able to access the internet and, and, and social media, please let us know. Uh, if we know who those folks are, we can try to communicate with them in a different way. So call the office or send us an email and uh, let us know who those people are. Lastly, and most importantly, Easter is almost upon us. Good Friday, this coming Friday, and uh, obviously Easter Sunday next week. We are going to have communion online uh, during the Good Friday service itself. Thought lots about this. This is happening in a lot of contexts. Our denomination has approved the idea. Good and faithful ministers are, are serving it otherwise, I've discovered. Here's the theological rationale. When we meet even here physically together, we commune with Christ by his spirit. He is not with us physically. He's seats, is sit, seated at the right hand of God the Father. But his spirit is with us. And uh, through communion, we find unity with him. We commune with him in spite of his physical absence. Well, next week we're going to commune with one another and with Christ by the Holy Spirit. You don't need to be here physically in order to experience communion with the Lord and with the people of God online. God is able to unite us in that way. So please prepare. Get some bread, pieces of bread set aside for those who will participate. Also uh, uh, cups with juice in them uh, that will be uh, uh, what you will receive uh, as I serve communion to you on Friday. So please keep that in mind and uh, let's look forward to what God has for us in both of those services. We can still have a great Easter together, although in a different fashion. God will be with us and God will be at work. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to bless what we do uh, as, as we dig into scripture, as we look to his word to speak into our lives and impact our lives and encourage us again. So let's pray together. Gracious God, we're just thankful for one another. We're not physically together, but Lord, we are united by your spirit. And we're here now to hear from your word, this incredible book, the Bible, inspired by your spirit, that we might know your mind, your heart, um, that we might know the truth of God and um, have that truth applied to our lives. So wherever people are today, mostly in their homes or maybe in other contexts, we just ask our God that you would be with us and that you would speak to encourage us and to challenge us, to remind us of who you are, to help us in these difficult days. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Not sure about you, but I've watched a lot of uh, news in these last weeks. Uh, most days I, I seem to tune in uh, several times to find out what's going on. And I have found myself seeing lots. Uh, and the news isn't good in many, many instances. I have also found myself recognizing that I have pictures in my mind as I remember what I have seen on the news. Uh, and it has it had impact in me. Maybe you will be the same. For example, I, I have been struck by the image uh, of people in white hazmat suits, I believe in Europe, loading caskets onto a refrigerated truck. I, I was really shocked to see that, that it's come to that place in Europe. It's such a sad reality. I have a picture in my mind of an older couple, one of them inside a nursing home, the other on the outside of a nursing home looking through glass, and the two of them gazing at each other but separated. I can't think of anything other than the word tragic to describe that reality as people are afraid and uh, separated from one another. I have a picture in my mind of a 
couple getting married and the only other person present with them in their ceremony is the minister. There's a sense of ex- excitement that I, uh, that I picked up from the couple, but I'm sure there was great regret that day also that friends and family couldn't be present. Sadness as well, in my experience. I picture from Florida, from a beach in Florida, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of young people partying. They're my time to party, one of them said. Please don't ask me to uh, not gather together in spite of the fact that their gathering together will probably produce harm in their lives, if not in the lives of their parents or grandparents, maybe significant harm. And as I looked at that, and as I think about that picture that's in my mind, I feel dismayed and frustrated, even annoyed with those young people. Last one I'll share with you is the picture of a young nurse with tears in her eyes as she had just held the phone up to the ear of a an elderly person who was dying so that the family on the phone could say their goodbyes. There's a real sadness in that as well. There's a compassion for the nurse who is obviously in tears because of it. But a sadness for family who had to say goodbye that way, a sadness for that er er elderly person who would ultimately die alone. You see, these pictures are very present to me and I'm sure they are to you also. And in the end of the day, the more I see and the more I hear of this bad news, this sad and discouraging and tragic news, the more those pictures dwell in my mind and tend to be discouraging. Well, in light of that reality, I want to take you to a passage which I think can be helpful to us, which can encourage us and also challenge us. The beginning verses in Hebrews chapter 12 are the ones that I want us to look at today. But let me give you the context before I read them. First of all, the the book of Hebrews, the letter of Hebrews, was written to Jewish Christians, people who had come to believe with all of their hearts that Jesus was the long-promised Messiah, the anointed one sent by God to save them, to bring them salvation. They were in a difficult place in a Jewish context as believers in Jesus. They were struggling, they were hurting, they were being persecuted. Uh, and, and, And the letter is sent to encourage them. To, uh, it's a call to endure in the midst of hardship. As a result, second part of context, Hebrews chapter 11 was written. And if you know the text, it's, it's a chapter filled with stories of where God's people remain faithful in difficult and challenging times. The word that is used there is that they were tested. And in their testing, they endured through the struggle and remained faithful to God. So what we're looking at is a challenge by the author of of this epistle for the people of God then, and can I suggest today, to remain faithful in hard times, in discouraging times, in challenging times. And I would suggest, of course, here we are. I want to read to you Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 to begin. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that's a reference to what proceeds in in chapter 11. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Notice the analogy of a race that these people are given. Uh, They are running towards something of significance. They're running toward the completion of a race. They're running toward victory and they're being called to, to, to move toward that finish line and to do it well to throw off anything that might encumber them, entangle them, to throw off sin that might keep them from running the race well, to throw off, as it says here, everything that hinders. You know, attachments to things that might not be helpful or attachments to people, relationships that are causing trouble and difficulty and keeping them from moving forward faithfully. To, 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 to throw off fears and worries, any kind of emotion, get rid of anything so that they can run faithfully as all these heroes of chapter 11 have run. So much so that they are focused on their, their race. It's their priority. It's the passion of their heart to succeed in what they are doing. They're calling in the midst of heartache and challenge and difficulty. And then along comes verse 2, which is where I want us to focus our our minds today it says there let us fix our eyes on jesus the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne 
of God. You know, a remarkable passage where we are told to fix our eyes on Jesus. Gaze at him, look at him, keep him central to our view of life, especially in the hard times. And, and he's described in two ways. Number one, he's described as the author of our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, if you think about this and you think of the word author as simply one who writes a book, you're not going to catch the essence of what's being described here. Um, but what is being meant in the use of this word literally is the idea of creator or originator. Think of an author of a, a work of fiction. I love historical fiction. That's what I tend to read for fun. But that author is going to sit down and, and he or she is going to create an entire world, uh, a, a circumstance that you get drawn into. He's going to, or she's going to originate that reality and then create characters and develop the characters as the story goes along. And you get caught up in that world, if you would, because of the creation of, 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 of that world story and the characters that are held within it and what's being said here of jesus is that he is the creator of our faith he is the originator of our faith other translations to ca call him the pioneer of the faith or the founder of the faith you see it is through the person of jesus his coming and his death and his resurrection that our faith is formed uh, he has established he has established this faith of ours um, he defines it, and he is our focus. Let me read to you Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, uh, a verse that has a lot of relevance to what I'm describing. It says there, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. The author of our salvation, Jesus himself, even he, as he came into this world, suffered and he endured faithfully to ultimately, as Hebrews 12 says, uh, sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what we are called to do is to gaze at this one who is our faith, the one in whom we believe, the one who can encourage us and who can strengthen us and who can enable us by reminding us of the truths that form this faith of ours, that he is a sovereign God and that he is able to see us through. And then the, the verse describes Jesus as the one who is the perfecter of our faith. Not only the author, the creator, the originator, he's the perfecter of our faith. And the idea here is of one who is a leader who will complete the challenge for us, if you would. He will lead us forward into the challenge and through the challenge, and he will lead us beyond it. He is the one that will strengthen us so that we do endure. He is the one who will work by his spirit in our lives so that we will persevere, the text is saying. He is the one who will enable us to complete the race. We will cross the finish line as we gaze on Christ and know his presence and his power at work in us in order to accomplish the things that we long to accomplish. See, Jesus is the sustainer of our faith and he will sustain us through the challenge all the way through as we gaze on him, as we were reminded of who he is, the truths of our faith, and the presence and the work of Christ in our lives. The Apostle Paul references this in a similar way, similar idea when he says this, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It describes Jesus as he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? He, Jesus... He began the good work in, in us. He's the originator of faith. He's the creator of faith at, that is at work in us. And it is he who will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's an amazing promise that is contained in both of these texts. Jesus is the one we must gaze on, my friends. We must fix our eyes on him. We must remember who he is. We must remember the truths that he brings into our lives. We must remember what he has done for us. And in the midst of that recognition of Jesus, we will be strengthened and we will be enabled as we go forward until the end of the race where we will triumph because of him and because of his sustaining grace. It's amazing. And then verse 3 in, uh, in Hebrews again, Hebrews chapter 12, says this, consider him, similar to fix your eyes on him, 
Think about him. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Well, once again, a lot of relevance there. Anybody finding themselves growing weary of COVID-19? Anybody who feels the potential of losing heart because of the circumstance that they're living in right now? The potential is there. And I guess I've suggested to you today, the more we gaze at the bad news, the death and the separation and the loss and, and so forth, the more likely it is that we will grow weary and we will lose heart. We are to gain strength by fixing our eyes on Jesus and not the circumstance we find ourselves in. I heard a great illustration of this late, lately, and I want to tell you of it. Stories of a man who loved dogs but didn't have a dog and decided to buy not just one but two Dobermans, Doberman pincers. Uh, if you know those dogs, they are big and they are powerful and they are intimidating. I once had a Doberman turned out to be a very friendly dog but just run toward me and I'm looking at this powerful animal big dog I honestly I was afraid didn't need to be in the end but that's the experience of these dogs all was going great with this man with his two new dogs until uh, these dogs developed a habit when they were on a walk with their owner of lunging at garbage at the side of the road probably expressing their aggression together and wanting to tear that garbage up and make a mess whether it was set out for pickup or otherwise. Made walks really miserable for this man, and uh, he would have to fight with them, and you know, every muscle in his body was used to hold them back and trying to control them as they attacked that garbage. And in time, he grew weary of this and didn't want to take them on a walk anymore. Well, after a time, a friend said to them, listen, you just have to train them well. You have to teach them not to do that, and, and he did, and it worked really well. Whenever they came near garbage, as he could see ahead of them on their walk on the side of the road, all he had to say to those dogs after they had been trained was, eyes on me, eyes on me. And they would look away from the garbage and they would look up at him, you know, as dogs do when they're well-trained and they're attentive uh, to their owners. And they would look at him and they would walk past the garbage and they'd leave it alone and everything was great. From that point on, garbage wasn't their focus because they kept their eyes fixed on their master I want to conclude today by suggesting a couple of things to you to really think about um, number one is very simply let's not focus our attention our hearts our minds on the circumstance that we're in the midst of we can be aware of them. All these circumstances that can discourage, we probably need to be aware of them. I watch the news, although not so much anymore. And I don't read it nearly as much as I used to either. I want to know what's going on so that I can contribute well to what's happening in society, so that I can pray in an informed fashion, so that I can do what will keep me and my family safe. That's great. But let's not fix our eyes on the garbage. Um, I want to tell you, my friends, for us to do that will only cause us to grow weary, to be discouraged, um, to not be thinking and being aware of the things that should fill our hearts and strengthen and encourage us. And obviously what we need to do is fix our eyes on Jesus. It's like this word of God is saying to us, eyes on me, eyes on me. You know, we literally can train ourselves to focus our attention on the one who can get us through this. The one who can strengthen us and enable us and cause us to persevere. The one who can give us joy in the midst of struggle and heartache even and loss. He is the one, by his grace, who will sustain us and allow us to be faithful to the end so that we do finish the race, so that we finish it in victory uh, in a way that honors and glorifies God. Now, how do we do that? I want to coach you a little bit as I have in recent Sundays. Um, what I'm going to say to you might sound a little bland, and it may be the kind of thing that you would absolutely expect me to say, and maybe even cause you to turn me off a little bit because I'm saying it again. But what I would really encourage you to do, and I don't want you to do that, by the way. I want you to listen to this, and I want you to practice this. 
What I want to encourage you today is every single day to take time away on your own with Jesus. And I want you to read his word and I want you to pray. But I also want you to do this. I want you, after probably scripture reading and after prayer, to sit quietly in the presence of Jesus and close your eyes. And I want you to ask him by his spirit to give you a picture of him. Um, I don't know what the spirit of God will give you in those moments. Maybe that he'll give you a picture of Jesus with children on his knees. Maybe a picture of Jesus feeding five to 10,000 people and teaching them about the truths of the kingdom of God. Maybe Jesus healing people. Maybe Jesus overcoming the power of evil in someone's life, life and casting out demons. I don't know what that picture will be, but I pray it will be of God. But what I also want you to see at some point, I trust you will see at some point the reality of the fact that Jesus, as this text says, is sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is exalted. Jesus is the eternal, sovereign son of God. Jesus is a God who is more powerful than all the struggle and hardship and difficulty that human beings experience, always have and always will until he returns. Jesus is the one who, who, who is sovereign over COVID-19 and any other challenge that our circumstance might bring to us in these days. My friends, I want you to look at him. I want you to fix your eyes upon him. I want you to gaze upon him in your mind's eye. And I want you to develop a picture of Jesus that will sustain you during these days. Not just once, but day after day after day. And according to this text, if we will fix our eyes on Jesus, <laughs> the one who created our faith, and the one who will perfect it in us as we go forward till the point of completion in Christ Jesus, as Paul writes. I want you to know that you will make your way through this time. Not without heartache and difficulty. We're never promised a life following Jesus without heartache and difficulty. We're living in a fallen world and we have COVID-19 and we have illness and we have death and separation and so forth. But my friends, as we make our way through such circumstances, if we will fix our eyes on Jesus, we will be sustained and we will be enabled and we will persevere as people of faith. As those people in Hebrews 11 described did, as Jesus himself did, we can too. Knowing the presence and the power and the enablement of the sovereign Lord of all. Take time with him. Picture him most and allow that living Lord Jesus to strengthen your life for his glory and for your good. Let me pray with you. Gracious God, what a powerful instruction we are given when we're told to fix our eyes on you to gaze upon you in your beauty and in your strength that we might be enabled to see our way through this circumstance. Lord Jesus, we hear that instruction, eyes on me. Just keep your eyes on me. And we pray, Lord, that we will be able to do this. I pray for every single person listening to this sermon today, whether from, they're from our congregation or otherwise. And I pray, Lord, that you will reveal yourself to them, that you will give them pictures in their mind's eye of who you truly are, rooted in Scripture, filled with the truth of the faith that we hold. And I pray that as a result of fixing their eyes on you, Lord Jesus, that they will be encouraged and strengthened and sustained as they run this race until its completion. Bless every person, God, I pray, who is listening to these words today. Be with them by your spirit. Enable them by the grace and the strength and the beauty of Jesus Christ to run this race well. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the voice of love that's called There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands Everything you 
going through You keep standing at a distance In the shadows of your shame But there's a light of hope that's shining Won't you come and take your place So bring it all to the table There's nothing he ain't seen before For all your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior and he calls Bring it all to the table And he can see the way you carry that hold your heart but through the cross you've been forgiven you're accepted as you are so bring it all to the table there's nothing he ain't seen before for all your trials all your your burdens there's a savior and he calls bring it all to the table so come on in take your place there's no one who's turned away all you sinners all you saints come right in and find your grace All your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness is a savior and he calls, bring it all to the table.